Agajanian Quinn, a member of the California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to Joan Quinn, Etc. Our guests are singer-actor Harv Presnell and artist-director Stephen Verona, two very verbal celebs. <laughs> <laughs> Harv Presnell started his music career right here at USC, but we first heard about him when he starred in The Unsinkable Molly Brown on Broadway. He was in that show for two and a half years. Then Harv did the smash film version with Debbie Reynolds. His other films included Paint Your Wagon, Great Man's Whiskers, <laughs> and Glory Guys. He did daytime TV, Ryan's Hope for ABC, and I've always wanted to ask you two things. When you did those films, did you have hair? Yes, I did. <laughs> that uh, was before uh, the first Warbucks and the first Annie, so I had hair, but since I did the first Annie, I have not had hair. So we have shaved every day it, for the last five, six years. That's yeah. what I wondered. You do, do you think you have any hair underneath there? <laughs> yes, because if I let it grow for a couple of days, it, it gets all sandpapery. And uh, I don't know what color it is because I never <laughs> let it grow out far enough. But, but I shave it every day, every morning, because if, if I let it grow out and then shaved, I would have to go through that whole terrible routine of getting your scalp used to exposure to the air and the wind and, and shaving every day. That, so that's, it, is, it is tender, yeah. That's yeah. something, too. Do you wear a hat when you're not on the stage? I should. Um, I don't. In the winter, when it's really cold, because you lose so much heat through your head. Um, in the summer, if it's very hot, I wear a hat. But I'm not, uh, I don't care to have a hat on unless it is extreme temperature. The other thing, is Harv short for Harvey? No. George Harv Presnell is my, fa my grandfather's name. And my son is named after me, one of my sons. So we have three generations. Ah. It's Welsh. I don't know <laughs> what derivative other than that. But George is my first name. Uh, so now that you're doing Daddy Warbucks mm. in Annie Warbucks, mm -hmm. how do you play the role? Do you play it differently than when you first started with Annie? It's a continuation of the character that I did originally. And um, I think he has more dimensions now because he has adopted Annie and given her his last name. He is able to say, I love you, Annie Warbucks, for the first time. He says, I love you to anybody. <laughs> he is funnier. He is uh, more vocal about a lot of things, pol political things in particular. And I think he um, exposes his attitude toward the world in general, business-wise, more in this play than he did in the first one. Yeah. So in the first one, you were on the road for... Oh, yes. Wait, was time. it already playing on Broadway when you were I on came the road back, with it? I came back from Europe uh, a year after it had opened. I, I didn't see. even know about the opening. I, I was kind of leading a sheltered life, I guess, in the opera. And I was hired to do it. I took a company out and then ended the last two and a half years on Broadway with it. Now, this has been, a, Annie Warbucks has been a slow climb, I guess. Yes. Why? Slow take and us, steady. Take us through uh, how well, it would be to start something new like this? We started in workshop uh, in Goodspeed, where the other one started. That's in Connecticut? Started in Connecticut, at the Goodspeed Opera House. And then we went through a workshop period there. Then we uh, mounted it again at, Dr at uh, Lincolnshire Marriott in Chicago. <clears throat> then we went to Drury Lane in Chicago. Then we went to uh, seven other cities, which is now, this is the last city on the tour. But it and, says uh, there are 17 new songs. Did, did those yes. songs change along yes, the way? Yes, they have, actually, and they're still doing so. We flip-flopped them, taken them out, put them in another place, cut them, edited them, changed them. As the script, we had 30 pages of changes before we came in here. For Just, and you've played for two years oh, yes. prior to here. Oh, yes. So it's still a work in progress. And we're closer now to what we will have in New York, but we have four weeks of rehearsals in New York after this and four weeks of previews in which we will tweak and change and fix 
and uh, get audience reaction there before we open officially on March 18th. Is this a trend in, um, say, in starting a musical rather than going outside of Broadway and coming right to Broadway? This is the first. It's an experiment. <clears throat> this uh, took some equity rules changes, some union rules changes, some uh, changes on our part to be able to go in and work for a minimum wage or less and put the because, show on. Because it's, it's on cost. the road? Absolutely. So if you were on production contract, for instance, the cost would be more than double, perhaps triple. So we've brought this musical along on a very low budget, very low cost to this point. And it's the first experiment in the CLO pre-Broadway tour season and in the wintertime also, which they never had before. So now we go on production contract in New York and then the costs really elevate, but then you're on a you're on a pre-Broadway run already. You're already there. We will have had the longest preview period or developmental mm. period of any show in history when we finish this tour. Do you think other uh, shows could follow suit? If they can attract enough of an audience base. It's extremely difficult, as you know, to preview a show that long on the road and attract an audience. However, we've had smash reviews and and had done very well, very good business. So it's uh, the other thing you talked about was changing, changing, changing. Yeah. How do you remember each time you go on the stage? Or it's extremely difficult. The hard part is to uh, forget the lines that you just did for the last three weeks or four weeks, and substitute other lines because the minute you walk in the set on stage and you hear a cue you naturally revert back to what you've done the most of. So those lines have to be edited out of your mind and your thinking and your rhythm in the scene before you go on. It's, it's pretty scary, let me tell you. It keeps you very thin and very healthy, and it's a very dangerous business. <laughs> Is that the preparation? <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, what's your preparation yeah. for doing a, a staying fit? Uh, I think <laughs> just the physical... Uh, Doing the show physically eight times a week certainly keeps you in good shape, but the um, the mental strain is we have then a break for two weeks and we do the play the same way for two weeks and then they all get here again the director the writer the creator oh. so on and then they start tweaking and changing and coming to you at the last second before opening night and saying you know I think it would be better if you said this instead of that. I say, why don't you try it first? Because now is opening night. It's very dangerous out there. And, um, and then he'll say, no, 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 do it that way. But be sure and tell whoever's on stage with you before you go on. That you're, how you're going <laughs> to <Yeah>. do it. <laughs> so you run to them and say, listen, I just got this note, so we have to do this tonight. And you see that panic and the sweat pops out on their face. And they say, are you sure? I said, yeah, just got the word. This is what we're going to do. Now, fortunately, I'm usually the one who gets that kind of change um, for whatever reason. I don't know. But because I, I, they assume that I can do it, I guess. So that's the driving, uh, the driving energy in the scene. And it usually works better the first night than it does the second night. <laughs> it's almost like ad lib. <laughs> oh. And yet, and yet this is a very delicate piece. So the rhythm of the piece has to be maintained. You have to be extremely careful that you don't disrupt that. One of the things that has always been said, I think, in show business is don't show your face with an animal or with a child. <laughs> and here you are with both of them. <laughs> I think they're both more mature than I am, so I'm, uh, I'm safe. Um, <clears throat> the child in question is Lauren Gaffney. She's brilliant. Um, I've been with her now two years, two and a half years. The dog is, is fairly new. And the dog is wonderful, well trained, and I, I think that the thing that makes an actor interesting, particularly this character, is if he or she can retain those childhood lack of fear, those childish attitudes toward delivering a line, an, an emotion, showing your emotions flatly in, in front. Those things are qualities that we tend as adults to lose, but as an actor, you must never lose them. So those are very important to maintain. And so that's why I don't mind working with kids and dogs. They no. say children, or actors are like children. That's true, very and you true. you have to be, I guess. Except when you go home and you try to use that as an excuse, your family <laughs> says, no, come on, Dad, you're home, 
or your wife says, please knock it off. You're not on stage now, yeah. uh, not in front of the camera, so let's shape up and be an adult, shall we? Let's talk about that because you, you are with the whole group of children on yes. stage and you have your own group of children yes, who do. have grown up. I yes, can't believe I six children. Six children, yes. I mean, not children anymore, but. They've grown up and uh, they're having families of their own. And so. Are they in show business? Mm, yes, a lot of them. Uh, some of them aren't, some of them. <laughs> in, in other areas, in other, uh, in other areas they are in show business and uh, they fortunately know enough about it to have steady jobs also on top of it. Did they gain your voice? Yes, uh, three of them in particular are magnificent uh, voices and they will uh, eventually when they're really mature uh, uh, have a choice to do this as a career if they want. Your bio says you live in Colorado. I don't know how That's you true. chose Colorado because you're never there. <laughs> well. <laughs> I, a lot of people now in my business, our business, are coming to Colorado, and I wish they would probably not come because I'm very, uh, very cherry about our area. However, I went to school in Aspen when I was a kid, and I skied the whole area, and I flew for Aspen Airways as a pilot, as a, as a teenager, actually. So my whole life um, has been geared to that kind of outdoor situation, and now I have a ranch in the front range in uh, Colorado. I don't get there, though. I mean, oh, it's, that, um, I see. It's so when hard. you came to uh, University of Southern California, did you come on a basketball scholarship? Uh, football, basketball, and track. Three sports scholarship, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then how'd you get into singing? Well, uh, the head of the music department uh, had heard me sing and said, um, I'll make the same deal with you if you go into music. So within about two months, I was out of, the f out of football, Sport. out of sports, and into music full-time because I was hired then to do the world premiere of the life story of David at the Hollywood Bowl. So that was my first professional job at 16. That was Dr. Hurt. Dr. Charles Hurt was the instigator of this whole thing and Roger Wagner who was at UCLA. Well, good so for both of them. Yeah. And then they and then you started training as an <clears> opera singer? No, I didn't train. That's uh, cool. I never took a lesson in my life. I had a, a, a man very well known brilliant man who played the piano, Correpitor, they call them in, in Europe, and uh, he trained me in the role, but nobody gave me vocal lessons. I didn't have time. I was working. And fortunately, I had a natural delivery, and, and there was no problem with, I had a very good ear for languages, so I spoke the languages fluently by the time I was there for a couple of months. And I worked a full season at the Paris Opera first, and then Berlin, and there was where I was hired to do Molly Brown on Broadway. I had never seen a musical comedy before I started rehearsals on Molly Brown. I think that's just amazing. Uh, it really is. Well, it's a wonderful story. And we have about 30 <coughs> seconds ah. before we leave. <laughs> okay. And to finish it, I want to know what your ideal lifestyle will, would be. Uh, having a steady job in this business on stage uh, at 8 o'clock every night doing what I really love to do. And that's you love idea. doing that. Yes, I do. Thanks, Harv Presnell, for being with us. <laughs> and we'll you. be right back. Don't go away. We'll see you after the break. Hello, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with Stephen Verona, who is a modern-day Renaissance man. Stephen Verona is a director. Stephen Verona is an artist. He makes films, he makes music videos, he makes photographs, he makes commercials, and he makes careers. In his first film, The Lords of Flatbush, he actually discovered Perry King, Sylvester Stallone, Henry Winkler, Armand Asante, Susan Blakely, <laughs> Ray Sharkey, Paul Jabara. How did you find all these actors? It goes on and on. Well, it started with Sly. It, um, he was at the Herbert Berghoff Studios, HB Studios in New York. And I was there to see another friend of mine work named John Hersfeld, who's now a writer-director. And I went to see John, and he went up to do a scene. I think it was from an O'Neill play. And he said that uh, he was going to do it with his friend. And Herbert said, well, we only work with people in the workshop, and we don't take people from outside. But nobody else was prepared, so John and Sly got up and did this scene, and frankly, Sly blew him off the stage. There was no question about it. And when it was over, we were all quite impressed. 
and we asked, what's his name? And he said his name was Q Moonblood. And he went from being an O'Neill character, he immediately went into being this fictitious Indian um, who grew up on a reservation north of Miami. And he completely ad-libbed the whole thing. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him and I'm saying, I know an Italian kid from the neighborhood when I see one, you know. <laughs> this is not right. This is no Q Moonblood. Anyway, when class was over, I went up to him and I said that I had written this movie and I think he'd be perfect for one of the roles. So he came over to the apartment, we became friends, the rest was history. And you did write Lords of Flatbush, I wrote, you wrote it. I wrote, produced, and co-directed um, Lords of Flatbush based on my life growing up in a motorcycle gang in the 50s in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, not the, I thought no, it was no, the Brooklyn. No, 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 Brooklyn. Flatbush is the Brooklyn. The Brooklyn! The Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and was, when you finally found out what uh, Moonblood Q name Moonblood. was. <laughs> yeah, well then we knew. Was so it Sylvester? Sylvester Stallone, did, yeah. did, he, did you call him Sly or did you call him Called Sylvester? Called him Sly almost from the day one. Is that what he prefers? Well, there's a story that I don't remember if I've ever told this story before or not. I don't know if he'd be appreciate this, but when we finished Lords of Fappish, he wanted to, he called me up and um, it was late one night, I remember, and he said that he really wanted to change his name before I did the credits for the movie. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, well, he thought maybe this name George Mac Brown or something like that. Well, George Brown was a football player who had just died of a blood clot in his knee. And I said, Sly, why would you want to change your name to the name of a football player who died? So he said, well, I want to play Cowboys. So he says, and besides, you know, the name Sylvester Stallone, I just, I just don't see the name Sylvester up on a marquee. And I said, yeah, I guess Bogart had the same problem. And there was this long pause, and obviously Sylvester Stallone stayed. So Humphrey and Sylvester Humphrey were from and the, Sylvester the same milk. <laughs> right, right. We have a clip of yeah. Sylvester right. talking about um, the Lords of Flatbush and how very base, I guess it was, when you were looking for It was a low-budget movie. A low-budget. Yes. Let's see that clip. And the reading went very well, but what Steve does is he tends to ad-lib. He says, oh, I, you know, get off the script, let's see if you're into the character. And that's where I think I got the part because I tend to have a, an ability to ramble on. So I was very grateful for that. Then, then the film, the, the filmmaking was interesting because especially in retrospect, I've gone on and I've done you know, very, very expensive films, but with The Lord of the Flatbush, it was the conception, it was, uh, I mean, Steve was bringing it back. We're, we're it was doing at a, the right time at the right time. Plus, we were doing his, well, but he, we, were, we were doing his biography, so it was kind of like we're doing uh, something that has a historical significance, but it was a very, very tight budget, and we would get dressed in the cars, and we'd wear half our own clothes, and this and that. I mean, matter of fact, uh, my participation, I mean, I, I think I, at the very end of the movie, I was paid with a leather jacket. It was real nice, you know, it was nice. But anyway, the movie came out, and I, I had no idea that uh, it was going to become such a successful film, and a cult film, but I have to admit that in that class, if Steven hadn't come up and said something to me, then said something to you, <laughs> I would not be here. So thank you, Steve. I love that, and thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Thanks, Sly, actually. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think some other people should thank you, too. Sally Kirkland said she thanks you, and Maria Smith, and... Um, um, Richard Gere. <laughs> well, I don't know if Richard thanks me, but uh, I guess I was one of the first people to find Richard, yes. yes. And how, and what? You didn't um, use him, though. No, I did use Richard for a, quite some time. In fact, Richard probably still gets uh, some residual from the movie, even though he's not in it. He was sort of the Kevin Costner of the big chill. He got... Um, edited out but in I shouldn't what? say no he was he was actually Richard uh, was let go in rehearsals and Armand Asante was actually cut oh. out <clears throat> that's very trendy yeah. to have Armand yeah. there now right yes <laughs> <laughs> and Richard's not doing better no I think not you had them both so yes, thank yes, you Steve yes. <laughs> there was a, there was a time you know it was one of those magic periods in New York where there were some really wonderful young actors that were available and we're willing to work for, you know, as Sly says, a leather jacket. Yeah, that was great. You also, um, yeah. we, we think about your film as a commando film, somebody well, said. Commando filmmaking, yes, yes. What is it? Well, I mean, with days that we would take the, uh, the BMT subway to Brooklyn to shoot the movie. We didn't have, uh, you know, Teamsters driving us and 
you know, camera crews, et cetera, and camera car and picture car. We were on the subway. We'd all there. Perry King would change into his wardrobe. People on the subway would get nervous because they saw a guy in a leather jacket. And we'd get off the subway and, you know, start shooting. It's really bizarre because this film was made with totally unknowns. Mm -hmm. And then in 1974, you did you made Boardwalk with all these No, that was later. Uh, 74 was when I did Oh, 79. Lords. I'm 79 sorry. 79 I did Boardwalk with um, Ruth Gordon, Lee Strasberg, Janet Lee, and uh, Lillian Roth. All above yeah. the title yeah. Marquee yes, Holders yes, from yes. Nobody's And in to actual somebody's. fact, I wrote Boardwalk before I wrote Lords of Flatbush. Oh, you did. But Boardwalk was a love story about older people, and it was a much more difficult film to mount. And I wanted, if you're doing a film about old people, it better look good. You know, you can't do commando filmmaking with Ruth say. Gordon and Lee Strasberg. <laughs> so I went back to, my, Boardwalk was about my grandparents. Lords of Flatbush was my life. About and you. so what we did was we went back to my life as a black leather jacketed, you know, teenager well, who uh, discovered art. Well, here you were five years after mm -hmm. you made Lords mm -hmm. of Flatbush directing these people. How did you feel confident? I was, I was Lee Strasberg's protege in ah, the 60s. I see. At the Actors Studio. And 1966 and 67, I sort of sat with him. And um, oh. we had a falling out. I made a film about my experience at the Actors Studio and working with the maestro, as he said. And um, the film was later nominated for an Academy Award. When it was nominated for an Academy Award, Lee was the third person to call me up and congratulate me. That was the rehearsal? That was the rehearsal. Oh, right. I see. see. And, and what year was that? Was that was after. actually made in 1966, 67, but it was nominated in 71. Oh, I see. Because oh, so. at the time I was directing what are now called music videos and television commercials. And I wanted dialogue in my films. And when I was doing commercials, I was doing Pepsi with Joe Brooks, who did You've Got mm -hmm. a Lot to Live and Pepsi's Got a Lot to Give. Mm -hmm. I never understood that. But And then Joe came and worked with us on Lords of Flatbush and did the soundtrack for Lords with Paul Jabara. Ah. So and I love the story about Paul back. calling you every day, you've got to use my music, you've got, got to it, use got my it, music. Got it, got it. And then he wrote a song and held me up for publishing. <laughs> That's great. He was and as fabulous. he said, he was paid with a half a tuna fish sandwich, I think. <laughs> <laughs> he one got a black leather jacket, one got a half a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, then um, you got to the point where you came to a crossroads, and well, you made Well, I always a painted. I always painted. And after Boardwalk, Boardwalk was not a, a success, a financial success. Um, critical success, because the performances are really superb. I mean, it's definitely one of the strongest performances ever that Ruth Gordon has given. And in one of her biographies, she claims it's her finest, and that I was one of her favorite directors, which, looking back on her 70-year career, that's a very flattering statement. Also, um, I just felt that Boardwalk should have done more, but the distribution of it was very poor. And so I f sort of backed away for a while. And I went to China to do a movie with Ingrid Bergman and Nastasia, hopefully Nastasia Kinski. Ingrid Bergman announced she was sick and the movie was canceled and the money dropped out. So I ended up staying in China and painting. And for the next year and a half, that's all I did was paint China. So you, you made a film uh, called Self Portrait. And well, we the have French made a film of, of me, a documentary of me from Excuse that. Excuse me, yeah. the French did. Yes. And we're going to just see a short uh, mm -hmm. clip from that that really tells us about your feelings and your inspiration for your artwork, mm -hmm. because we have your beautiful paintings on the set. So let's see that, and then we'll come back and talk some more. Fine. Art school was an awakening period for me. I discovered so much so quickly. Abstract Expressionists, Pollock, Rothko, de Kunig, all the way to the pop artists of Warhol, Lichtenstein, Rauschenberg, and Rosenquist. In my own art, I'm attracted to everyday occurrences, like people sitting on benches. I try to bring the viewer closer to being there. I reflect normal life. At other times, I play the consummate voyeur. I might try to evoke a feeling or emotion when I have little to say I might do a still life, although I normally get inspired by people, architecture, and light, those three components. I also enjoy putting opposites together, the working man against the aristocracy. In painting, I go with what strikes me, but writing scripts, it's totally different. It's story, characters, and dialogue in that order. In 1973, Picasso died 
My mother called me and she said, Stephen, you know, Picasso died? And I said, yes, Ma, I know. She said, you know, he died a billionaire? I said, yeah, Ma, I know. She said, uh, you know, no movie producer, no director ever died a billionaire. And I thought about it and I said, yeah, you're right, Ma. Then there was this long pause and she said, uh, so tell me, son, are you still painting? Are you still painting? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Would yeah. life have been more complete for you with just one profession? Well, I think it's sum it up. Um, the robin always sings the same song, and I just happen to have a bigger repertoire than <laughs> other singers. So. That's great, Stephen. And to us, Stephen Rona will always be a writer, producer, director, artist and a very good friend. Thanks, Joan. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And thanks for being with us on Joan Quinn, etc. We'll see you next time.